Alrighty, what is up traders? It is January 1st, 2023. 2022 is actually over. Uh, it is flown by so quick. And I didn't do a recap video in November. I mentioned I'll include that in this recap with December. And then of course, we're gonna go over 2022 as a whole. I'm um, just reflecting on on this year for me and for not just me, for the traders, all for anyone who's been trading this market. Um, and yeah, so we're, let's jump right in because this might be a long video. So. Um, November is will be quick, probably the quickest part of this video because I just don't think there was a whole lot to go over. Um, and again, I didn't do a recap because I was just busy. The, the the last week of October or November and the first week of December was quite hectic for me. Um, so we're filling it in here. However, in general, this would have been a quick recap. It was just by itself. There really wasn't a whole lot, right? I made 14 grand, which again is still a great month, still great to be green. Uh, but in terms of eventfulness, um, any amazing opportunities or even terrible trades like didn't really happen, which is good in both cases, right? Um, you know, if you look at my stats, like my biggest loss was 6K, that's that's great. Um, I love any losses under five figures, really. Um, average losses back down to where I wanted. I know I mentioned in pre previous recaps that, you know, I really wanna get my average loss back down to that level. It, you know, losing multiple five figure losses any given month is not what I wanted to do. And I've had, I have done a good portion of that in the previous months. So I am glad about that in terms of risk management and just having good proportions of wins and losses. Um, but in terms of like what got me to be green, there was only really a few um, trades. One of them, and it was on the 15th, was Jewel. Now Jewel has been, and this whole theme of the whole year has been these these kind of scammy China pumps. Um, and Jewel was a big one back in the beginning of 2022. Uh, did not play it here, but I knew because they happened before, you know, they, they can happen again. and. I don't even remember. I don't. I actually don't think I played it on this day. I think I missed it, um, but because I knew they were still kind of in the process of, of dumping or, or kind of taking the stock lower um, over the course of the months, you know, I, I was keeping on watch for another one. Um, again, I don't know when the next one's going to be, but I just know when they do them, usually they'll do them again and again and again um, till pretty much they take it to pretty much worthless. And so when I saw all this volume kind of coming in. On the 11th, I actually took a small loss. I believe I lost like three grand or so thinking they were gonna kind of take it lower because this is pretty good volume on the daily chart um, in comparison to what volume they've used in the past to kind of dump it 50, 60, 70%. But they didn't, so I took a small loss. It wasn't until two days later they actually dumped it. And you know, if you heard me talk about my iLag experience back in October, you know, iLag was a big wide eyed open or wide, eyes wide open moment where you know, I need to change how I play these because uh, it just, if I keep playing the way I was, I was going to lose way more money in the long term than I ever wanted to. Um, and so I did that and I'm really proud or and happy about how I played Jewel. I played Jewel much, much smaller. Um, let's just go into the intraday here of the chart here. Um, Jewel, I played much, much smaller size. Um, you know, I kind of waited for confirmation. I didn't really get short anywhere in here. Although I wouldn't, it wouldn't have been an issue if I did. Um, mainly the reason why I didn't is because the last time they had volume, like I said, two days ago, they didn't dump it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to wait to see if they actually will take it lower versus last time there was just volume and it didn't go anywhere. Um, so I did actually get short into, you know, some weakness, but I, I'd rather prefer that in this scenario because I wanted to see if they were actually going to kill it or dump it. Um, and they did, right? They took it lower and I was all covered by the $1 to, to 90 cent area. Um, and unfortunately, I actually took it much, much lower. Uh, the main reason why I covered around a dollar is because just previous pumps have only, only gone to a dollar. I haven't really seen many go below it. But again, that's not a reason that they couldn't. And clearly, Jewel is now an example of that, right? They took it down almost, I believe, 50 cents, just above 50 cents. So, missed some downside. But again, I, I blocked in about 15 grand there. So, I mean, I really, I mean, you could have just, I could have just traded Jewel and been done, <laughs> right? I could have been just been done. So really besides this trade, everything else is break even. Um, but some other notable trades, I know one of the one of the stocks that really was a pain in the butt that I thought was actually gonna work very well but didn't was CRTD. CRTD has been known to be a crypto related stock back you know, previously, let's go back and see if it's run the previous. Um, it has not, but I remember, I remember something tying to it or if you read the, the company description or PRs they've sent out in the past was about crypto and you know, among this run, you know, the first week of November, it was right into when the whole FTX, Sam Bankman free disaster hit the crypto market. So crypto's dumping and this thing is like still going up, right? And so 
um, I wanted to be a part of kind of catching this backside. And as you can see, it was not an easy backside. And in fact, it was quite a pain in the butt to the point where I just kind of gave up. I said, I don't really care. Um, luckily, I only took two losses on it. About one was like 2,400. The other one was 3K. Um, both being, I think, in this kind of three or four day chop fest up in the other ties. And finally, it did dump, which I was looking to cover under a dollar. Um, it totally missed that though. And then it comes right back to highs, double tops, and then finally an actual backside sell off. So very annoying, very un unlike, you know, this kind of a run up from a ticker like this. But then again, just the way it moved uh, was quite a pain in the butt. Like you can see here, I believe this was my second loss on it. Um, you know, we didn't even normally, I think my first loss was shorting around kind of a red green area. Like the first day, it, the first day it potentially could have had a red day. Uh, but that didn't work, and so I'm trying the second time here thinking, let's be a little more patient, let's let it go red and hold red, um, and then like try to add on a breakdown. That's why you see me adding down here, which in hindsight kind of looks like a pretty bad chase into weakness. Um, but again, I just tried to try different scenarios of like, uh, clearly being too early can, can be a problem, like from last trade I took. Um, so let me try to be a little bit later. Like I'd rather be late and right than early and wrong kind of thing. I've said that before too. So... That's why you see that me, me shorting more there and then adding more here um, and finally cutting it. I was like, you know what? No, this thing's a pain in the butt just like it was before. Nothing has changed. And um, and yeah, and that's that. And again, it did end up working that one day, but I already had thrown in the towel. And even if it did, right, you're if you're looking to be patient for like a real fade, you, you were, you know, pleasantly surprised and ended up taking losses back to the highs. So um, pretty lame there, but only lost 6K or 5K ish between the two trades there so that's good um and then other than that november really trading mmtlp quite frequently was also uh, a common theme for november i took a quite a few losses thinking that they were they might double top this um you know the first run up which i believe i talked about in october was at the high you know 750 area and they really based it above or right below that level for a good really two weeks um and I was kind of, and when it gets, to, when stocks get to like this in this area, it's kind of conflicting because it's like, okay, are they going to break it out or are they holding it here to then actually just sell it off, right? What is this actually consolidation or is it is it a failing breakout? So there were a few times where I shorted this, thinking that they I would risk the highs. I'm only to keep it coming back and shopping around. So I took a few, few like maybe two or three, four k losses in here, maybe one, two or three throughout this two week period. Um, finally, it does break out convincingly. Um, I did not buy the actual breakout on this day of the. 14th, um, I actually waited to buy it late day above eight into the close because that's usually how I like to buy breakouts. I don't like to buy the actual breakout, which is what most people like to do. Um, there's really no right or wrong way. I just, again, I am, like I said, rather be right, late and right than early and wrong. I definitely take that approach to breakouts. I would much rather be late and have the breakout proven to be right than trying to be early. And again, if you're early and it does work, you end up with great gains. Like that's why I'm just not a, the, the biggest and biggest best long trader because my gains are never that big because I kind of prefer winning more smaller than winning less but bigger size or bigger gains if that makes sense so um, I did buy it over overnight into the uh, you know low to mid eights um, next day we gap up I end up selling I believe unfortunately I don't have a, a intraday chart of it um, but I believe I remember selling by the mid nines touched almost tense that was great um, I tried taking it a long overnight one more time because I'm like, let's just continue this trend going, right? If we're going to really run, we could look like this where every day, I mean, every day is a gap up push. Every day is a gap up push, um, except the last day. But again, I'm, I'm willing to trust that it, it just keeps kind of supernoving, um, right? And it didn't. Uh, we gap up a little bit. I ended up selling some either for the gap up and for break even at red green. Uh, but ultimately, like 5,500 from this breakout between these two to three days, which is pretty solid for for me not having traded long on the long side for quite a long or quite a serious time of this year, right? And if you if you trade the OTC market, like there just hasn't been a lot of great longing opportunities this year. So to have a breakout like this go and work um, was quite sweet. Um, I'm not sure if I traded it long any other times besides that. Um, maybe I scalped it on this day when it broke out again. Um, but really from then on, from this point on, which kind of leads to the end of November into December was me kind of shorting it. Uh, I missed the top day on the 22nd, just because I thought it would go higher. I did not expect um, the backside to come in just after one green day of the new kind of breakout. Um, so I missed that. However, because it was such a large red candle, I did think to myself, okay, this probably has a second red day. Um, it 
it's a pretty common theme, right? First time it had a red day in October, second time it had a red day. Even even this smaller breakout, right, that I talked about, right? It had a red day on the day I sold it, and then even the next day it had a small red day and actually went below yesterday's lows on the 17th here. So, uh, you know, I missed the first red day, like I said, on the top, wanted to actually get short for the second red day and made some money there. Um, ignored it most of the rest of the, rest of the days. But then if you notice, there's also this trend here where every day it opens, it ends up closing lower, right? Even if it gaps up, like every day is a red candle, regardless whether it actually closes green or red on the day, it clearly the opening price is near the high a day and then it's kind of done for. And so when we came into the 30th, where it was kind of gonna be breaking the support lows of like the 950s, the 960s, um, I did get short and ended up having a great fade into the, the eights. Um, Still don't think I have a daily chart. That I've, I've, it's a common theme. That I, as I'm reviewing my trades for this video, it's a common theme that I actually didn't have a lot of these intraday saves, which which bugs me. I think I got lazy a little bit. Um, but the days I did save was this huge day where it actually, I mean, this this is not a wick or not a misprint. It did go to five and then immediately spiked up to almost 10. Um, I did make some money on that day, uh, which I will go into. And then really the last day I made the most money of, of this whole run up. Um, which is nice. So let's look at that here. Um, yeah, so this this intraday chart was on the, this is the 6th of December. Um, so yeah, sorry to cut off November so quickly, but that was pretty much it, right? Um, like I said, really, Jewel was really it. Um, the MM, MMTLP wins just kind of mitigated all the small losses. Um, and in a lot of ways, I could have just taken a lot of these days off, right? I could have just stepped aside, right? Nothing was that spectacular, nothing was that amazing. Um, again, ground to be green, but it's also just just a would call it a stepping stone month, right? In terms of activity or opportunity in the actual markets. Um, but then going into December, like I said, we end up still trading in MTLP. It kind of just flows right into it. And on this day here, the sixth um, was this kind of huge move. And the reason why it happened, well, first in the morning, right? I'm I'm still kind of sticking with that trend of that the opening price is usually where the the high day is. And then the rest of the day, it's just fading. So I did short out the open at seven, uh, covered it by six at the best, ended up going as low as five. So that's, that's you know, left some profits on the table, but that's, you know, nothing new. Um, but this spike, you know, the whole reason why MMTLP was running is because MMAT is the actual company. MMTLP is the preferred shares of MMT or MMAT. Um, and there's a whole rabbit hole of how this happened. Um, and essentially, you know, the, you wanted to, People wanted to own MMTLP to eventually get shares of a new spin-off company that they were kind of creating. Um, unfortunately, and why why I was always bearish on this is that one, the company was private, so you weren't getting new shares of another company. You were actually, I mean, you're getting shares, but they were going to be private, so you can't sell them. They're in the private markets; they're not publicly tradable, um, which already is like sounds like a disaster or a headache in and of itself. Like I would never want to do that. Um, and secondly. You know, spending one share at like say ten bucks of MMTLP just a few weeks ago, um, you're not going to get that same value in dollars to the new company, right? You still might get one share of the new company, but you paid ten dollars for one share, right? So there was a whole overvaluation of this thing, um, and turns out it ended up being a complete scam. So like, big shocker there, um, and that's why it's still halted, right? That's why this is red on this on stock trade here. Um, it is still halted. You know, if you're still long, I'm sorry, I, I, I have no idea whether you're going to ever get your money back. Um, likely not, um, quite a, a scam and well overstated at that. Um, but again, this spike pretty much, this happened because FINRA pretty much approved like that, that whole plan of you getting those shares going through. Um, maybe I'm wrong there, maybe they didn't approve it, but the point is there was news about, okay, this is, this is happening. Like it's, it's in a two, one or two days from here now, like it's, it's going to happen. And so there was this huge spike, um, almost like a parabolic, which is kind of why I call it like late para here. Um, cause that's how I treated it. I ended up reshorting at the highs here, um, covered for about a buck a share, made 11 K between, you know, these two trades here and here. So that was pretty sweet. Um, and then again, the last and final day, um, uh, where this was, this was the last day you could own it, I believe before, um, kind of this, that spinoff happened before you like the last day to own it and, and be a part of it. And people were just, you know, exiting at all costs. Right. Uh, I don't know if it was actual retail or it was just the insiders, but they wanted out clearly, um, because again, a after even even if the even if the the whole spinoff thing was legit, 
right? After after you've kind of been locked in, you know, LMTLP will become worthless, right? There was no point in owning it after that. Um, now, granted, there was like this little rule they had in their PRs where it's like, if you sold it, you don't actually get the shares, but then again, who reads the PRs, right? Most people don't. Um, so this day was kind of like the verdict of like, this thing's gonna become worthless. And so that's why I started shorting, um, covering a little bit, adding into these balances, uh, and then just covering in pieces again, and still still reshorting as I see it being heavy on the like level two. Um, and again, just kept covering into pieces, right? I really like how sm kind of smooth and uh, non-sporadic this chart is. Like I was very meticulous and careful and, and piecing in and piecing out, um, and made 15 grand on it. So I'm very happy with that. Um, and that was pretty much it. The very next day it halted. Um, I specifically did not hold overnight any any night short um, through this whole period for that reason. Like I just did not want to get caught in this whole spin-off dividend uh, fiasco that this was. Um, and th thank God I didn't, right? Because if it's halted, like it's still halted. <laughs> I don't really want to be short this thing. Even if it is worth it, like there's the odds of me getting my money out of the stock would be slim to none. So pretty, pretty glad of the way I traded that. Um, and then for the rest of December, Again, this, these these two weeks or so, um, very similar in a sense to November in that it was a little bit more green, like clearly more green green than October than November, right? Much more red days, um, but a lot of small gains, nothing huge, um, being very conservative, taking small wins. And this week was actually going to be a really good week until the last day, and I kind of unfortunately blew it on the 16th um, because of Cosm. Cosm, for those who don't know. When a stock does a reverse split um, and changes the the price of the stock, right? Cosm used to be like sub a dollar. I, I don't remember the exact, exact price, but this high a day here was like sixty or eighty cents, something in there. Um, they did a reverse split, and normally when you do a reverse split, right, every broker that you own the shares in will will ratio the shares accordingly, right? So if it's like a ten for one, you will go from an, an owning. 10 shares from going to own one share, right? Because the, the price changes and so your shares will change because the market cap hasn't changed. The value of the company is still the same. However, there was, I believe, a broker or two that screwed this up and they did not um, effectively change the ratio. So people kind of who owned Cosm woke up to owning the same amount of shares that they owned, but it was, you know, call it 10 times the price. I don't remember the actual ratio of the split. Um, so don't quote me on that, but it's like they ended up owning just as many shares, but at a price way higher than what they originally owned it at, right? And so for them, they thought, oh my gosh, I have a, I'm going to profit. And you sell. Well, it doesn't really work like that, right? Um, the, the brokers who screwed up, I don't know who they are, but they eventually kind of redo the numbers. I'm like, no, 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 you don't own 4,000, you only own 400. <laughs> and so a lot of the traders ended up net short because they sold 4,000 shares, which actually means when they really only owned 400 in this scenario, so they end up net short, you know, 3,600 shares. Um, so that's why you see this massive squeeze from, I mean, pretty much the highs, right, to pretty much breaking highs of the day, of, the, of their overall run just a few weeks ago. Um, because there were just, one, people who were net short from selling the shares they thought they owned, which they never did in the first place. And then, of course, traders like me who wanted to get short and kept pumbling over themselves. Um, so if we actually go into the intraday here, um, ultimately, the, the my mistake here was just giving it way too many tries. Uh, I... I you know, again, I was going into finishing the week off up well over 10 grand, you know, a lot of solid days, just three to 4k wins a day, um, even had made some money today as well. So I was up like 16 grand. And I remember, I remember talking about it and feeling good about it in, um, Clover Trading's chat room, just like, like I'm feeling good. This is a great week, just small wins adding up, um, probably won't trade the rest of the day. And what do you know? I see, I see Kazana and my, my, you know, chasing the shiny object, object degenness in, inside of me wanted to participate. And so unfortunately, like my first attempt wasn't until 12 here, which is pretty patient, right? I did not by any means have any interest in it all the way up until then. Um, and really, this was the best pullback we kind of had before we really squeezed, you know, to 20. Um, I got short in this lower high area around like the low 12s. It originally worked going in to the low as like 11 or the high 10s. Um, unfortunately, I did not cover any and it actually held and then it kept going, right? And so that was my, my first mistake. Um, not kind of taking any off and knowing that they were still holding it. Uh, and that kind of then led to the whole FOMOing of wanting to be there when it actually does pull back, um, revenge trading the fact that I lost when I had such a good week. And again, it just downward spiraled to me, you know, throwing a five figure week um, into making 2,500. But again, it's still green, it's great, it's not, it's better than giving the whole week back. 
but uh, giving as much as I did back was quite frustrating. And I have the the chart here to see how to show you just how kind of ridiculous it was. Um, you know, again, this was the first attempt. Like I said, um, originally worked, then didn't, then tried to shorting some, then covering some again, and before you know it, a loss. Boom, well, first loss. Um, tried again, another loss. I think I tried twice in here, right? Two more losses. Um, tried one more time again, another loss. And then finally, I tried it going into after hours and it works. I'm like, okay, great. Again, I am still down like 12, 13 grand. And then it comes to raging back. And I'm like, you know, the last thing I'm ever gonna do is get caught in an after hour squeeze being even more violent than the regular market squeeze. So what do you know, I cover the last piece at literally the top. I mean, you, my camera, my, or not my camera, my arrow covers like the top right there. Um, and what do you know, that literally that moment on just gets obliterated, which I thought should have happened here. Um, and again, covering it down here would have pretty much made my losses back. Again, I'm not in the I'm not in the mindset of trying to make it all back, but again, just, just knowing that I was looking to cover into the teens close to 10 as like a magnet kind of um, psychological round number, that that was gonna happen. And so just seeing that play out like that and not being a part of it, kind of screwing it up one last final time for my like, what, sixth or seventh try, um, very disappointing. And again, I took this screenshot, you know, after the first hour of, of pre-market or after hours. But if you look, like we went much lower. <laughs> we went, we pretty much gave it all back. Um, not all of it, but almost all of it back down to the single digits. Forget 10, like talk about seven. Um, so quite the quite the frustrating end to that. You know, again, like I said, just giving it too many tries, but then to finally actually, the pull I was looking for finally came and I screwed it up even then. So ultimately lost like 14 grand on this, just again, losing two to three grand each and every time. Um, between those six to seven tries and it's frustrating it sucks and I fortunately brought it into the next day on um, GOTU GOTU was again quite a, a frustrating ticker along with uh, TAL and EDU they were running in um, sympathy with each other being just Chinese education stocks I don't know what the MoMA was about them but they just did it um, again same thing in here I just got chopped up in these two days pretty much giving it like five to six tries of losing two to three K each losing another 10 grand there um, so going into, you know, this, this end of this week and then into the day where I decided just to, to sell everything, which we'll go into, um, not a great, not a great start or a, a great way to end going into the last couple weeks of the year, right? It was quite, um, frustrating, wasn't, didn't really feel too good. And I just kind of gotten this small rut of just giving these stocks too many damn tries. Um, luckily I did actually stop that and, and I kind of stopped that in its tracks when I sold pretty much everything that I wanted to sell into the end of the year. I and I had my I had my mind on it that I would have, eventually have to do this in December and I kept putting it off. I was like, "Oh, no, 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 we won't do it now. I'll just sell like one stock a day." And I kind of did sell like maybe one or two stocks in between these weeks somewhere out, somewhere around here. Um I even sold I remember and if you've watched some of my previous videos, I've sold like previous stocks that I've held for a very long time. I forget when I've done them, but I know I did a couple in the summer. I know I sold one in like September. Um so throughout the year, I knew this was coming, but I just didn't want to like face like the facts of it or the, the actual reality that like most of these stocks I own are not coming back. And so finally on, on 19, I said, you know what, screw it. It's either now or never. Like it doesn't matter whether I do it today or the last week, like it just, it's, it's, it's happening, right? Um, and so that's why you see this huge loss because I just sold all of my stocks that I had kind of once put money into and thought it was gonna play out. And most of them were revolved around crypto. Um, you know, if you know how I like to trade, I trade day trade stocks, but I like to kind of buy cryptos long term, um, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I thought I was smart back in the summer here when we kind of pulled 50% back uh, the whole crypto market to buy some of these Bitcoin related stocks, whether they were GBTC, where you just actually own Bitcoin through a trust, um, you know, whether you own ETCG, you own Ethereum Classic through a trust. Um, I, I bought them because their discount, their NAV discount to value. Um, was at a huge discount, right? So like to, to make this, not to go into a whole other tangent here, but like, you know, if, if they have a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin, they were trading at like $80 million of Bitcoin. So you could buy Bitcoin for 20% lower. Um, like say Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin is trading around like 30 K here, right? Over the summertime. Um, but GBTC is trading as if Bitcoin was down trading at like the mid twenties. Uh, and so I thought it was smart buying some and originally it was right. It looked really, really good. Bitcoin made new highs. Of course, GBTC didn't because its discount value was, was getting worse. Um, 
and unfortunately from there it just got worse and worse and worse um, we did end, end up being in a bear market on overall crypto which again in hindsight it feels so dumb because like based on like how crypto moves like that time was the time for the top to be put in um i just got too convicted i got too caught up in myself of like crypto's going higher um it almost call it, you can call it greed if you want and um so not only did bitcoin go down causing gbtc gbtc to go down but so did its nav so did its discount right i bought it around like 20 percent it's currently now at eight bucks trading at like 50 percent discount which is so not only did i lose on the pullback of like the price of the the trust in general but i also lost you know call it 20 to 30 percent more in the fact that the nav value was just going down more right if, if the nav value didn't go down anymore you know gbtc should be trading in like the teens but it's not it's trading sub 10. so and originally the, again, the whole reason why i owned it still was because i was pretty convicted that eventually they'll be turning it into an ETF. And even now I, I knew they wouldn't turn it in, into an ETF till now. It was more, more, more like a multi-year thing. But as I've kind of researched it more and again, constantly reevaluating my thesis, um, I, I soon realized like the, the odds of them turning it into an ETF are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller every week, day that more information is coming out. Um, and the more I'm looking into it, there's other things they could have done to improve the discount and possibly get rid of it. Um, and they're just not doing those things, right? They're, they're, they are kind of doing things that don't seem legit. Um, they're doing things like, they're, I think they came out with a plan, Grayscale came out with a plan of like selling 20% of GBTC's shares to like other people to kind of get that discount price up and to save them from going bankrupt because their, their, their sister company Genesis is in deep trouble. And the whole point is, is like the whole reason why I'm in crypto and I invest in and I hold Bitcoin long term is because I believe in like Bitcoin, right? I don't believe in all this mumbo jumbo BS around it, right? The whole FTX fiasco, the whole all these companies going bankrupt, like that's not why I'm in crypto. I'm in crypto because of Bitcoin, because of the blockchain technology behind it. Um, and so the fact that Grayscale did all this bull crap about um about it like oh we're gonna sell some shares or oh we're gonna look to to you know change our share structure and all the all these bs things they've come up with um or trying to do it's like that's not why i'm here and so finally i realized you know what screw it i don't even care at this point if they come, come an etf or not um maybe down the line they do but again at the end of the day there's the tr there is the actual trade to capture the nav discount and then there's investing in crypto. There's like, and I, and unfortunately I combine the two, right? And I think a lot of people made that mistake in GBTC because they believed, believed it for so long. And finally, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting out. Like, I don't care. I don't care if this is the bottom or not. Like the, the reality is this is not how I wanted to do it. Um, if I'm going to try to capture that NAV discount and like have it go to an ETF, that is a trade, right? I will, I will like to, I would like to participate in GBTC for that trade, not for that investment. And I kind of combine the two if you, if it's making sense. And so that's what led to the losses, right? So I lost, you know, about 130, 140 grand on GBTC. Um, I lost like 100 grand on ETCG. Um, another five figures on LTCN. Um, I longed also a lot of other tickers that were like crypto related, like some of the miners like ARBKF, they're going bankrupt, they're out. Um, BTBT, BITW, right? So all these, I just said, you know what, screw it. I'm, I own some weed stocks. I owned, um, what's it? Freaking, uh, what is it? Why am I forgetting the name? Nugs, right? Nugs is one of the scammiest kind of uh, weed runners if, of all time. But again, I owned it because I'm just thinking to myself, when weed runs again, Nugs is going to be huge, right? You saw Nugs last run go from, you know, sub or for practically five cents to 60, right? So I, I'm longing and thinking next time there's a weed run, it'll be good. And at the end of the day, like I'm just kind of lost patience and maybe weed will run, maybe it won't. But to go kind of sub penny at this point, it's like, why, why am I here, right? Why do I have money parked in this shitty, uh, you know, scam of an OTC? Like, it's just not what I want to be doing. Um, so I, I sold them all, um, ate the losses. Again, better for taxes, right? I just kind of took away some of my gains, but there were already losses being there, whether I took them or not. They were sitting on realizing like that for most of the year. Um, and so I just said, screw it, I'm out, I'm done. Um, so that's why you see that there. And you might say like, and I, there was a great question when I, when I talked about this on Twitter, um, he, someone asked like, Kyle, you think after six years or five years in, you would learn not to bag hold. Um, and you're right, like, absolutely. And I think, the, and the, I think the reason why I got so caught up into it is because I think when most people, at least when I think of bag holding, um, you think of people who bought a stock for as a trade, 
had a stop loss. It's broke that stop loss. They don't sell because they're just they don't want to take that loss, and then the stock keeps going down and down. They're like, oh, it'll come back, and it goes down and down and down. You know, my situation was a little bit different, although it wasn't any better, right? I'm not trying to justify that what I did was better. But the, when I bought, when I went in buying all these tickers, you know, my stop loss was zero. Like I actually did go in with the saying like, okay, if all this money, and again, in 2021, I made, I made over 2 million, right? I was making so much more money than I really could move and use, right? So I had like, you know, call it half a million dollars that was like, well, I'm not really trading it. Um, I don't really need it in my bank account. Let's just park it somewhere, right? And so that's where I kind of put it in all these things. I'm like, well, if this money truly went away, would I really need it? And it's like, no. Um, and so unfortunately, I took that as a sign or as a way to just say, well, I don't need to really risk any one level. I, I firmly believe in crypto or again, I firmly believe in Bitcoin, right? I don't, I think, and now I'm learning, like I said, there's a big difference between that and all this other bull crap, bullshit, you know, excuse my French, um, that's associated with it. And so I got tied up in that. Um, and so forget, forget not having a stop loss and just not selling it. I just didn't sell at all. <laughs> you know, I just didn't have a stop loss at all. I just kept holding and holding. Um, and finally I'm okay selling it now. I feel much more fresh. I actually feel relieved. Like, let's throw all that crap out of here. Um, get back to what's actually makes me the most money, which is trading, right? Not trying to mix trading and investing kind of deal. Um, and so, yeah. And so from there on, I got rid of that. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've been being really good due to two big plays. One was being uh, YGMZ, again, another China scam. Um, YGMZ had this huge dump back in the day in 2021. Um, again, I missed it, but this time they're doing it again. Um, and again, played out very similar to ILAC. And because I've you know almost lost my ass on ILAC, um, I was very familiar with how this would play out. And so, um, I, unfortunately, again, I, I'm pissed at myself. I don't have the intraday chart of this, of uh, me trading it. But um, if you remember last time when I talked about ILAC, you know, I don't want to have more than like $50,000 of risk in it. And if I'm going to be stubborn, you know, if I'm, gonna, if I'm not going to stick to my losses or my stop loss like I didn't on ILAG, you know, I only want 50K in there. That way, worst case, if it goes 100%, I hit my max stop, I'm done, I'm out. I'm not risking losing six multi six figure losses. And so in YGMZ, you know, this immediately started playing out like ILAG. And because I knew ILAG was like so insane and, and blew out so many traders, unfortunately, um, had such big volume, I was prepared for YGMZ to do that or a little bit less. The reason why being less is because I just thought we weren't in that same amount of like volatile market. There weren't as many short sellers willing to trade these anymore because again, when you when you nearly lose an account, like some people don't want to come back from that and they don't. <laughs> Luckily, I had a little bit of fortitude and, and put plans in, and rules in place to help me keep in, my keep my head in the game. Um, so I ended up taking a small like starter in the fives here and you might say like, Kyle, are you breaking your rules here? It's like, no, I, the starter means like, I, would, I didn't even have 50K, I had like 20K. Um, very small, um, really no set risk until until I actually had a top in. And again, I was fully prepared. Like, okay, if I start, if this is an if this truly is an early start in, and this thing goes to ten, what am I losing? I was gonna lose like again twenty k, little a little fifty percent or a hundred percent push, um, or move. And so I was willing to take that risk, um, given it was a start. And so once we topped out, once we really, you know, stuffed super hard in the sixes, not even close to twelve like I like did, right? Not even halfway. Um, then I started adding once we really started selling, you see how the hugest volume is, um, finally had a new risk level of these highs. Um, and with the ads was still only risking like 20 K max. So I'm really happy at how that went. Um, added a little bit more here as I moved my risk down to, um, I didn't move my risk down until to 450 until the close. Um, but I still had my risk in like the mid fives up in these wicks. Um, the fact that it didn't dump that day, I kind of expected that. Like I like did the same thing. Um, and also, if you actually look at the daily, right, um, YGMC did the same thing as well. Like, right, had the, had its red day or had its dumb day, and the next day it went lower. And so I swung overnight, um, covered it all, sub two. I do have the intraday of my covers, so you can see that here. Um, swung it overnight, had it dump, covered it, you know, sub two to 150, and made like 80k on that, right? And so that's and that's how I want to play them, right? I, I would love I love how I played this because I kept it safe when it was dangerous, right? In the squeeze, I kept it under 50. Um, even if I was being stubborn, it was well under 50, um, which wasn't even being stubborn. I willingly was going in with a starter, like I said. Um, and it didn't add and risk, have a set risk and dollar amount um, that I knew I was willing to accept um, until it was backside, right? Um, so super, super happy how I played that. That's definitely how I wanna play them in the future if I'm gonna be aggressive, um, which YGMZ, you know, once we were backside, I definitely was, like I said. Um, and yeah, 
So let me just check my battery here and make sure we're good. All right, cool. Um, and again, so that was that was on the 23rd. The next week was the classic OTC pump and dump clo. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into detail in this because if you go back and watch, and I've, I've referenced this video numerous times, my very first YouTube video years ago, like the pattern is still the same. Um, they still happen and that's just how I traded them and play them. Um, although I did get chopped up pretty good on this one um, around this area. I kind of thought this was like a lower high um, before the actual fade back to lows, um, but it didn't. It actually had a second wave in it. Um, was able to get good ads up in like above five on like the last day or two. Finally dumped, covered it uh, once it reached sub one the last couple of days of the week or the year. Uh, again, covered it all by the 28th. And that was that, made like 50K ish or so on it. Um, however, a lot of this, a lot of these borrow fees here was from Clo, so you know you cancel them out. I, I probably only made like thirty or so. Um, 29th was was Tesla. Uh, Tesla had a huge bounce. Again, I'm not a first green day trader that well or that good at it, um, but when something like Tesla, you know, has the biggest panic it's had like in its lifetime, um, I was willing to give it a shot and did catch this gap up to a green day, so that was cool. Um, and that was that. So really glad I had a great end of the year that really saved, you know, not saved, but certainly made it look better in terms of just trading wise, right? Investing wise, right? We're, we're in the shitter. <laughs> like I said, with this huge bad day. Um, and that's why I tweeted about it, right? Um, you can see how it is just including both. But then if you just include just trading, right? If I just never bought all those crappy stocks, right? And just kept stuck to what I do best, which is trading. Um, we have a hundred, almost 150 K a month. Right. Um, not only that, you and then you put on the year, you know, almost a million dollar year. Right. R remove the like HKD losses, and boom, we're over a million. Um, so that was pretty sweet to see. That like trading wise, I've done really good. I've actually had a pretty decent, great year. Um, it's just getting caught up in the whole buying long term. Um, and I'm not saying buying long term is bad. Like again, in, in fact, that we're in like in a recession, we're down you know, 20, 30 percent in the spy and the QQQ. Like. For term people like well 401k is like and, and kind of the buy and hold kind of strategy it's probably a good time right i'm no, not financial this is not financial advice not a financial advisor um but i'm not bashing holding long term like holding good companies long term works holding companies that i did long term doesn't <laughs> so um i learned that lesson i know the difference now um and ultimately now overall on uh my profit curve at profitly you see how kind of rough of, of this year it's been. Um, you see how kind of how smooth it was going into it, but now we've gotten quite choppy. Um, this this little pullback here in April was my first you know red month in a long time, um, and then we get even worse here with the H the whole HKD madness. Quite a huge pull there, and then now selling all the all the long term investments. You see just how brutal it gets, right? Um, and again, some of them I sold at different times. Um, like I, I recorded it all on the 19th, but like, it's so complicated. Like my taxes, I, I it's going to be a, mad, a madness. Cause like I, I bought them in an individual account and then turned my trading business into an LLC. And so I had to transfer the positions and then sold some positions in one account to buy in another. It's like, a, I don't even, I still almost to a degree don't even have it all down. <laughs> so, um, it's ridiculous, but that's why you see it kind of all scattered. And of course the last six months of the year, cause like when I bought them versus when I transferred them versus all this bold BS. Um, but ultimately this is where I'm at. I'm at 3.6. Um, but something I want to note though, and this is a great tweet from, uh, the trading peep, um, just to show what, like how your trading is supposed to look or what's, what's good for you or not good for you, but what's good for like trading wise and looking at your profit curve right up top here is what I used to look like, right? You have good edge and you have good risk management slash psychology. Um, here in 2022, this is what my chart looks like, right? You have good edge, but you have poor psychology or risk management. Um, for me, it was poor risk management, like I said, right? I had no real stop loss, I was risking zero. Um, I had, went on a, quite a few rides um, in terms of HKD, ILAG. Um, again, these, these, these stocks that I had no really stop loss in them. And so that's why you see it look like this, right? Clearly there is, this looks, this is, looks really similar to this. It is this, and everything before that looked like this, right? If we go back, how smooth it was, right? Um, and some of you may be, be here or here, right? And I was there. All, all, every single one of these charts, all four of these charts are actually in this chart. They're just in a different time frames. So you can kind of see I've gone full circle. I've experienced all of these, um, which is a good learning experience. Great way to really solidify my trading. Um, I know Tim Gratani certainly went through this. Um, Tim Gratani had a full year really where he, he didn't have the same problem with me of like investing into taking big losses on his investments or long-term holds. 
he just went through his, his period of like taking multiple six figure losses, right? And I, I unfortunately, and I, even the way, in the same way I've done that with HKD, like I said, I'm not even, me and Yatani are still the same in, in that respect in this um, kind of period in our trading. I believe his period too was around uh, 3 million in terms of price. So maybe that's just how the learning curve of, of being a, a profitable trader goes, who knows? Um, but yeah, so now that I've learned that, now that I really know what it means to have kind of all four of these charts and what it looks like, um, it only makes me stronger for, for the future of 2023. Um, as for what it looks like, you know, I'm going to keep sticking to what works best, which is trading. Um, you know, again, some of my stats here, finally ending the year, uh, just under 500 K, um, percent return is quite low. Cause I actually started with a lot of money you know, and in ending 2021, like I had a bunch of money. Um, I've wired a bunch out. Um, so we're going to start with much less 2023. Um, Again, some of my biggest losses here are way bigger than my biggest wins, which is not the trend from previous years. Um, if you go back and watch some of my annual recaps, you'll know that. Um, and yeah, overall win rate is still okay. 56 is not bad. But again, average loss is terrible because of those big losses made it so worse. Same thing with, with a loss percentage. Um, just owning these stocks down more and more and more and losing you know, 80, 90% on them or 60, 70, like clearly makes that, that awful. Um, so... It is what it is. Again, I'm, I'm more relieved than disappointed, right? I'm glad it's in the past and now I can move forward. And, and you don't, and also you see that immediately, right? Like I said, like these last, these last few days of the year were incredible trading wise because I almost, you could say that the weight of like the, the all the BS I owned and, and was dealing with is gone. It's off my shoulders. So i um, happy with that. You know, such a tough year um, to be, to be made just under half a million is still uh, amazing. Um, I know many traders personally who either have had to actually physically stop trading, um, who have, I know one guy, I'm not even going to mention him, per, you know, his name, but like lost a ton this year and was in a situation where he could sell his car. <laughs> and I'm not saying that's what you should or shouldn't do, but that's just his personal experience. Like, he's like, I don't need a car and I want to trade. I do not want to quit. I'm, I'm not a quitter. I, I want to do trading for the rest of my life. He's like, I'm going to sell my car. And so he did. So now he's going to use that money. He's using that money to trade with, um, cause he doesn't technically, technically need a car. Right. So. That's just one extreme experience, our extreme experience for himself um, and his personal experience in trading. Um, but again, some people have taken off. And again, this is just a tough year for everybody. So I think we're all collectively looking to move on. Hopefully, 2023 will be better. Um, there's no guarantees, right? The overall marking conditions are still kind of similar going into this year. But at some point, it will end, right? We've, we've had the, the whole boom and bust, the whole boom of 2021, the whole bust of 2022. Um, like everything, it will pass. Um, so just a matter of staying in the game till we get there um, and hopefully having, hopefully using these lessons throughout this year to take us and have an even better year or better trading experience um, going forward. So thanks so much guys for watching. Um, happy new year. Good luck to you guys in 2023 and I will uh, catch you guys next time. See ya.